section one of birds and all nature volume seven number two february nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by betty b a baby heron rest h metcalf how many of the boys and girls who read birds and all nature ever saw a baby heron i am sure you would like to see ours he measures from tip to tip of his wings that is with his wings spread just as far as we could stretch them five feet and ten inches and from the tip of his bill to the tip of his toe very nearly five feet now isn't that a little baby he is nearly full grown but has not on the dress of the old birds that is why we call him baby he is called a crane by some people but his right name is great blue heron and his scientific name is ardia heredius shall i tell you about his dress his head is all dusky now but when he puts on his new dress his forehead and central part of the crown will be white enclosed by a circle of black a fine black crest with two elongated black plumes that make him appear to be very much dressed up his back and wings are blue-gray but like his head will be decorated with elongated scapulae feathers when he gets on his dress suit and his long neck which now has a rather dingy look will have a beautiful collar of cinnamon brown tinged with purple and a white line in front from throat to breast the tail is short and very inconspicuous he really is a beautiful bird in spite of his long neck and long legs he is the largest of our new england herons and is not very abundant you may find him about large bodies of water and during the daytime he prefers the solitude of the forests and sits quietly in tall trees for hours but in the early mornings and late afternoons he may be seen standing motionless at the edge of the water until a fish or a frog appears when with unerring stroke of his long beak as quickly as lightning he seizes it and beats it until death then swallows it this act is often repeated he varies his diet with meadow mice snakes and insects so he certainly does not lead a very monotonous life our baby ate for his last breakfast four good-sized perch wasn't that a fine breakfast i know you would like to hear about his early home it was in a terribly dismal swamp where it was almost impossible to reach through mud to your knees and through briars and tangled bushes high as your head there several feet above your head was a nest nearly flat made of different sizes of twigs put together in a loose and lazy manner usually there are three or four light bluish green eggs only one brood is reared in a season there are some people who say that the blue heron is good for food but those who have once tried it do not care for another plate they are the most suspicious of our birds and the hardest to be approached for they are constantly on the lookout for danger and with their long necks keen eyes and delicate organs of hearing they can detect the approach of a hunter long before he can get within gunshot they have a very unmusical voice their call being a hoarse guttural honk once they were found in large numbers but now are seldom seen but in pairs or singly and what a pity the foolish fashion of trimming ladies hats has nearly exterminated so many varieties of beautiful birds god gave us many beautiful things to enjoy in this world and are they not more beautiful when we can see them alive in nature just where god placed them than they are when dead and taken by pieces to adorn our heads end of section one this recording is in the public domain section two of birds and all nature volume seven number two february nineteen hundred read for librivox dot org by betty b the killdeer agiolitis vocifera dr livingstone described a relative of this bird which he met with in africa as a most plaguy sort of public-spirited individual that follows you everywhere flying overhead and is most persevering in his attempts to give fair warning to all animals within hearing to flee from the approach of danger 
a characteristic which has caused the kill deer to be an object of dislike to the gunner it is usually the first to take alarm at his approach and starts up all other birds in the vicinity by its loud cries it can run with such swiftness that according to audubon to run like a kill deer has in some parts of the country passed into a proverb it is also active on the wing and mounts at pleasure to a great height in the air with a strong and rapid flight which can be continued for a long distance in the love season it performs various kinds of evolutions while on the wing this plover is found throughout temperate north america to newfoundland and manitoba nests throughout range and winters south of new england to bermuda the west indies central and south america from march to november and later it is resident and is very abundant in spring and autumn migrations these birds are generally seen in flocks when on the wing but scatter when feeding pastures and cultivated fields tracts of land near water lakesides and marshes seem necessary to it the sound uttered by it kill deer kill deer dee dee is almost incessant but it is often low and agreeable with a plaintive strain in it when apparently in danger the voices rise higher and shriller cows horses sheep and the larger poultry that wander over a farm are said not to alarm these birds in the least but they are wild in the presence of man wherever they have been persecuted they will often squat till one is close upon them and will then suddenly fly up or run off startling the unwary intruder by their loud and clear cry in winter the killdeer is an unusually silent bird in which season it is found dispersed over the cultivated fields in florida georgia the carolinas and other southern states diligently searching for food davy says that it may often be heard on moonlight nights the nest is placed on the ground usually in the vicinity of a stream or pond often on an elevated spot in the grass or in a furrowed field it is merely a slight depression in the ground the eggs are drab or clay color thickly spotted and blotched with blackish brown and umber small and quite pointed they are generally four in number measuring one point five o to one point six o long by about one point one o broad the plovers resemble the snipe in structure but are smaller averaging about the size of a thrush their bills also are shorter they have three toes usually their bodies are plump short thick necks long wings and in some instances they have spurs on the wings they pick their food which is largely of an animal nature from the surface of the ground instead of probing for it as their shorter bills indicate the flesh of the kill deer is not highly regarded as a food end of section two this recording is in the public domain section four of birds and all nature volume seven number two february nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by betty b the cinnamon teal anis cyanoptera davy says that the geographical distribution of this beautiful teal is western america from the columbia river south to chile patagonia and falkland islands east in north america to the rocky mountains casual in the mississippi valley and accidental in ohio it is abundant in the united states west of the rocky mountains breeding in colorado utah nevada california idaho and oregon its habits are similar to those of the blue wing its favorite breeding places are in fields of tall grass or clover not far from water the eggs range from nine to thirteen and the nest is so completely woven of grass feathers and down that it is said the entire structure may be picked up without its coming apart oliver davy the well-known ornithologist says that it gave him pleasure to be able to add this beautiful duck to the avifauna of ohio as an accidental visitor on the fourth of april eighteen ninety five a fine male of this species was taken at the licking county reservoir by william harlow on the sixth mr davy skinned and mounted it 
and it is now one of the rare ohio birds in his collection it proved to be good eating this he says is the first record of the cinnamon teal ever having been taken in the state the eggs of this species are creamy white or pale buff the average size being one point eight eight by one point three eight end of section four this recording is in the public domain section five of birds and all nature volume seven number two february nineteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by diana schmidt a scrap of paper eleanor kinsley marble a bluebird sings on the leafless spray hey ho winter will go he arrived that year very early in the season it was about the twelfth of february that i first heard his plaintive note far up in the maple tree could it be mr bluebird i questioned as i hastened to the window opera glass in hand yes there he stood not too comfortably dressed i am afraid in his blue cap sky-blue overcoat and russet brown vest edged with a trimming of feathers soft and white there had been a slight fall of snow during the night and i fancied from his pensive note that he was chiding himself for leaving the mississippi valley to which he had journeyed at the first touch of wintry weather in illinois if it wasn't for the snowdrops the crocus the violets and daffodils he was saying in a faint sweet warble i'd linger longer in the south than i do they dear little things never know down in their frozen beds that winter will soon give place to spring till they hear my voice and so no matter how bleak the winds or how gray the sky i sing to let them know i have arrived my presence heralding the birth of spring and death of winter it well repays me i am sure when in march under the warm kisses of the sun their pretty heads appear above the ground and smiling back at him out they spring dressed in their new mantles of purple and yellow at this moment from the topmost branch of an adjoining maple came a low sweet tremulous note very much indeed like a sigh ah said he surveying the newcomer with flattering attention that is the young daughter of mr and mrs bluebird who nested in lincoln park last summer for some reason they decided not to go south this season but remained in chicago all winter she strikes me as being a very pretty young lady bird and certainly it will be no more than friendly upon my part to fly over there and inquire how she and her family withstood the rigors of a northern winter from miss bluebird's demeanor when he alighted upon a twig beside her i concluded she greatly disapproved of his unceremonious approach prettily lifting her wings and lightly trembling upon her perch she made as if to fly away but instead only changed her position a little coyly turning aside her head while listening to what the young gentleman had to say encouraged by this mr bluebird's manner became very friendly indeed and very soon reassured by his respectful demeanor and sentiments uttered in a voice of oh such touching sweetness the young lady bird unbent responding at length in a very amiable manner i noticed to her companion's remarks the conversation which followed may have been very commonplace or very bright and sparkling but as there is always an undercurrent of sadness in the bluebird's note and an air of pensiveness expressed in its actions one could only conjecture what the tenor of this one might be the pair to my intense satisfaction the next day met again in the top of the maple tree exchanging confidences in low tremulous strains of surpassing sweetness uneasily shifting their stations from time to time lifting their wings as is their pretty habit and trembling lightly upon their perches as though about to rise and fly away 
the following morning which was the fourteenth day of february mr bluebird's manner when he greeted his new acquaintance appeared to offend her very much she was cold and distant whether from maidenly coyness or a laudable desire to check his too confident proprietorship sort of air who can say in no way daunted that gay bachelor pressed his suit warmly picturing in tones of peculiar tenderness the snug little home they would establish together what a devoted husband he would be attentive submissive following her directions in all things miss bluebird shook her head it was all very well she replied for him to talk of poetry and romance but he knew well enough that upon her would devolve all the serious cares of life while he would be very active in hunting for tenements submitting no doubt to her choice was it not the custom of all the mr bluebirds to fly ahead in quest of material gaily singing while their mates selected and carried and builded the nest what poetry would there be in life for her she would like to know under such circumstances and then when all was done to sit for hours and days on the eggs she had laid in order to rear a brood oh no she was not ready to give up all the pleasures of life yet and then and then miss bluebird lowered her eyes and stammered something about being too young to leave her mother what argument mr bluebird brought to bear against this latter reason for rejecting his suit i cannot say but being a wise bird he only stifled a laugh behind his foot and continued more warmly to press it again and again he followed her when she took a short flight quavering truly truly no doubt telling her of the many good qualities of the mr bluebirds how devoted they were how they ever relied upon the good judgment and practical turn of their mates never directing never disputing but by cheerful song and gesture encouraging and applauding everything they did then too unlike some other husbands that wear feathers they regularly feed their mates when sitting upon the nest and did their duty afterwards in helping to rear the young as he talked miss bluebird's coldness gradually melted till at length she coyly accepted his invitation to descend and examine a certain tenement which hoping for her acceptance he had the day previous he said been to view we can at least look it over he said artfully noticing the elevation of her bill at the word acceptance though of course it is too early in the season to occupy it mr purple martin lived in it last year and miss bluebird interrupted him a trifle haughtily i thought is the tenement you speak of in a stump fence hole or tree cavity she inquired neither he hastened to answer it is a box erected by the owner of these premises ah she said graciously that is another matter and very amiably spread her wings and descended upon the roof of the box in question you see explained mr bluebird the man who put up this dwelling knew what he was about he had no intention the sparrows should occupy it so he built it without any doorsteps or piazza as you have no doubt remarked really replied miss bluebird in my opinion that is a great defect a house without doorsteps is just what certain families want interrupted mr bluebird smiling our enemies the sparrows cannot fly directly into a nest hole or box like this as we can but must have a perch upon which first to alight it is for that reason my dear this house was built without doorsteps no sparrow families are wanted here miss bluebird at this juncture thought it proper to be overcome with a feeling of shyness and could not be prevailed upon to enter the box more than once her companion flew in and returned to her side singing praises of its coziness as a place of abode with new furnishings it will do capitally he said we might even make the purple martin's nest do with a little miss bluebird's bill at once went up into the air if there is anything i detest she said scornfully it is old furniture especially second-hand beds if that is the best you have to offer a prospective bride mr bluebird i will bid you good day and the haughty young creature
prettily fluttered her wings as if about to fly off and leave him do not go he pleaded if this house does not please you i have others to offer and miss bluebird moved apparently by his tender strains sweetly said truly and condescended to fly down and enter the box it was scarcely a minute ere she reappeared and flying at once to her favorite branch in the maple tree called to him to follow a scrap of paper woven into his nest by the purple martin the past season fluttered to the ground as she emerged from the box and while the pair exchanged vows of love and constancy up in the maple tree i picked it up and saw not without marvelling at the sagacity of mr bluebird who probably had dragged it into sight a heart faintly drawn in red ink and below it the words thou art my valentine End of section five. Section six of Birds and All Nature, Volume seven, number two, February nineteen hundred, recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. The Clapper Rail, Rallus longirostris crepitans. This bird, sometimes called the saltwater marsh hen, is found in great abundance in the salt marshes of the Atlantic coast from New Jersey southward. It breeds in profusion in the marshes from the Carolinas to Florida and has lately been found breeding on the coast of Louisiana on the Gulf of Mexico, Dr. A. K. Fisher having taken an old bird and two young at Grand Isle in 1886. The clapper rail arrives on the southeastern coast of New Jersey about the last of April, its presence being made known by harsh cries at early dawn and at sunset. Nest building is commenced in the latter part of May, and by the 1st of June the full complement of eggs is laid, ranging, says Davy, from 6 to 9 or 10 in number, 13 being the probable limit. Farther south, the bird is known to lay as many as 15. On Cobbs Island, Virginia, the clapper breeds in great numbers, carefully concealing the nest in high grass. The color of the eggs is pale, buffy yellow, dotted and spotted with reddish brown and pale lilac, with an average size of 1.72 by 1.20 but there is a great variation in this respect in a large series at the nesting season the rails are the noisiest of birds their long rolling cry is taken up and repeated by each member of the community the thin bodies of the birds often measure no more than an inch and a quarter through the breast as thin as a rail is a well-founded illustrative expression to get a good look at these birds in their grassy retreats, says Nesch Blanchon, is no easy matter. Row a scow over the submerged grass at high tide as far as it will go, listen to the skulking clatterers, and if nearby plunge from the bow into the muddy meadow, and you may have the good fortune to flush a bird or two that rises fluttering just above the sedges, flies a few yards trailing its legs behind it and drops into the grasses again before you can press the button of your camera a rarer sight still is to see a clapper rail running with head tilted downward and tail upward in a ludicrous gait threading in and out of the grassy maze the rail can swim fairly well but not fast its wings are short but useful, and it is so swift-footed that dogs chase it in vain. End of section 6. This recording is in the public domain. Section 7 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 2, February 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. THE SWINGING LAMPS OF DAWN by Charles Coke Woods And near the threshold of my home a wily foe had strayed, and on a rose-tree in the loam a wondrous thing he made. Beneath the cover of the night he built a silken gin, 
and at the break of morning light bade all the homeless in each shining cord was made with skill and woven with such grace that none would dream he meant to kill in such a royal place the beauty of that bright bazaar no one could ever fear its mirrors caught the morning star that glistened crystal clear its swinging lamps were globes of dew enkindled by the dawn and when the morning breezes blew across the velvet lawn the shining lamp swung to and fro in ravishing the eye till all garbed in light robes all aglow was every flower and fly but when the lights began to wane as sea tides slowly ebb i heard the minor notes of pain issuing from a web and as my cautious feet drew nigh i heard the dying song of one deluded wayward fly that watched the lamps too long end of section seven this recording is in the public domain section eight of birds in all nature volume seven number two february nineteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Laszlo Beauregard The Late Dr. Elliot Coos, C. C. Marble The subject of this sketch, whose death occurred on Christmas, 1899, at Baltimore, Maryland, was one of the few men who have become famous in both physical and psychical science. He had long been recognized as one of the leading naturalists of America, and of late years had acquired equal distinction as a philosopher. Early in last April, Dr. Koo supplied us with the material for a sketch of his life, to which we are indebted chiefly for what this article contains. He was born in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, September 9, 1842, and was the son of Samuel Elliot Coos and Charlotte Haven Ladd Coos. His father was the author of several scientific treatises which anticipated some of the more modern views of physics, astronomy, and geology, so that young Coos would seem to have inherited his bent of mind toward study and research. The name is of Norman French origin. Dr. Coos's father was a friend of Franklin Pierce, and early in the presidency of the latter, received from him an appointment in the United States Patent Office, which he held nearly to his death in July 1867. The family moved to Washington in 1833, and Dr. Coos had always been a resident of that city, excepting during the years he served in the West and South as an army officer or engaged in scientific explorations. As a boy, he was educated under Jesuit influences at the seminary now known as Gonzaga College. In 1857, he entered a Baptist college, now Columbia University, where he graduated in 1861 in the academic department and in 1863 in the medical department of that institution. To the degrees of A.B., A.M., Ph.D., and M.D. conferred by this college, his riper scholarship added titles enough to fill a page from learned societies all over the world. His taste for natural history developed early in an enthusiastic devotion to ornithology, and before he graduated, he was sent by the Smithsonian Institution to collect birds in Labrador. Among his earliest writings are the account of this trip, and a treatise on the birds of the District of Columbia, both published in 1861, and both papers secured public recognition in England as well as in this country, thus making the beginning of his literary reputation. While yet a medical student, Dr. Coos was enlisted by Secretary Stanton as Medical Cadet USA, and served a year in one of the hospitals in Washington. On graduating medicine in 1863, he was appointed by Surgeon General Hammond for a year as Acting Assistant Surgeon USA, and, on coming of age, passed a successful examination for the Medical Corps of the Army. He received his commission in 1864, and was immediately ordered to duty in Arizona. His early years of service in that territory, and afterward in North and South Carolina, were utilized in investigating the natural history of those regions respecting which he published various scientific papers. Though he wrote some professional articles during his hospital experience, Dr. Coos never seemed to have been much interested in the practice of medicine and surgery. After about ten years of ordinary military service as post-surgeon in various places he was, in 1873, 
appointed naturalist of the U.S. Northern Boundary Commission, which surveyed the line along the 49th parallel from the Lake of the Woods to the Rocky Mountains. In 1874, he returned to Washington to prepare the scientific report of his operations. He edited all the publications of the United States Geological and Geographical Survey of the Territories from 1876 to 1880, and contributed several volumes to the reports of the survey, notably his Birds of the Northwest, Fur-Bearing Animals, Birds of the Colorado Valley, and several installments of a universal bibliography of ornithology. The latter work attracted especial attention in Europe, and Dr. Coos was signally complimented by an invitation signed by Darwin, Huxley, Flower, Newton, Sclater, and about 40 other leading British scientists to take up his residence in London and identify himself with the British Museum. Dr. Coos also projected, and had well underway, a History of North American Mammals, which was ordered to be printed by Act of Congress, when suddenly, at the very height of his scientific researches and literary labors, he was ordered by the War Department to routine medical duty on the frontier. He obeyed the order, and proceeded to Arizona, but found it, of course, impossible to resume a life he had long since outgrown. His indignant protests being of no avail, he returned to Washington and promptly tendered his resignation from the Army in order to continue his scientific career unhampered by red tape. As an author, he is chiefly known by his numerous works on ornithology, mammalogy, herpetology, bibliography, lexicography, comparative anatomy, natural philosophy, and psychical research. He was one of the authors of the Century Dictionary of the English Language, in seven years, contributing 40,000 words and definitions in general biology, comparative anatomy, and all branches of zoology. During the last few years, he contributed several volumes in Western history, in all 12 volumes, and by study and research was enabled to correct many errors. In 1877, he received the highest technical honor to be attained by an American scientist in his election to the Academy of National Science and was for some years the youngest academician. The same year saw his election to the chair of anatomy of the National Medical College in Washington, where he had graduated in 63. He then entered upon a professorship and lectured upon his favorite branch of the medical sciences for 10 years. He appears to have been the first in Washington to teach human anatomy upon the broadest basis of morphology and upon the principle of evolution. Nearly all his life, Dr. Coos has been a collaborator of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, his name being most frequently mentioned in that connection. Many of the numberless specimens of natural history he presented to the United States government were found new to science, and several have been named in compliment to their discoverer. At the height of his intellectual activity in physical science, the spiritual side of Dr. Coos's nature was awakened. He became interested in the phenomena of spiritualism as well as in the speculations of theosophy. Belonging distinctively to the materialistic school of thought and skeptical to the last degree by his whole training and turn of mind, he nevertheless began to feel the inadequacy of formal orthodox science to deal with the deeper problems of human life and destiny. Convinced of the soundness of the main principles of evolution, as held by his peers in science, he wondered whether these might not be equally applicable to psychical research, and hence took up the theory of evolution at the point where Darwin left it, proposing to use it in an explanation of the obscure phenomena of hypnotism, clairvoyance, telepathy, and the like. He visited Europe to see Madame Blavatsky, founded and became president of the Gnostic Theosophical Society of Washington, and later became the perpetual president of the Esoteric Theosophical Society of America. In 1890, he published an expose of the impostures of Blavatsky, and from that time, his interest in the cult gradually ceased. Most men can do some things well, but nature is seldom so lavish of her gifts as to produce a genius who does all things equally well. It is rare to find a man like Dr. Coos who is capable of incessant drudgery in the most prosaic technicalities. Yet, blessed with the poetic temperament and ardent imagination, able to array the deepest problems in a sparkling style which fascinated while convinced. His literary labors would have killed most men, but to his grasp of mind, nature had kindly joined a strong, healthy body that proved capable of any demand upon his physical endurance that his intellectual activity might make. He was tall, 
well-formed, classic in features, straight as an arrow, with the air of the scholar, without the student's stoop, betraying no trace of mental weariness, a man with the tastes of a sybarite and the soul of a poet. To quote from a leading journal, the imagination of a goth and the research of a Humboldt. In conversation he was fascinating, possessing much of the personal magnetism ascribed to James G. Blaine. It was the pleasure of this writer to have many interviews and to enjoy a somewhat intimate correspondence with him almost up to the time of his death. End of section 8section nine of birds and all nature volume seven number two february nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by betty b bobby's cottontail granville osborne one name's bobby wilkins i'm a goin on six years old aunt polly says at i'm a gettin pretty pert and bold she ain't er might of use for boys and just about my size if tabby and me have any fun her angry passions risin when i try to make some sparks fly out of tabby's tail aunt polly says bad boys like you are sometimes put in jail but i don't mind her not a bit and make jest lots of noise and then she looks so cross and says deliver me from boys two my aunt polly likes her cat enough sight better than me and keeps a coddlin it with cream and sometimes catnip tea seen some tracks behind their shed and nez i says says i i'll catch your mr cottontail to make a rabbit pie so me and tommy baker found her empty cracker box thought we'd have it big enough for fear he was a fox and then we popped her cover up and fixed it with a spring i shut it sudden if the bang is tight as anything three we cut her fresh green carrot top and put it in for bait was both so sure we'd catch em at we could hardly wait pounded in some steaks each side and made it good and stout if mr cottontail got in he never could get out tom stayed with me till mornin and almost for it was light we run behind their shed and found our trap all shed up tight and then i shouted got him and tom threw up his hat Blame of that old rabbit wasn't my Aunt Polly's cat. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 10 of Birds and All Nature. Volume 7. Number 2. February 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Diana Schmidt. The Country, the Country from a club of one by a p russell l h d trees think of them in the united states thirty-six varieties of oak thirty-four of pine nine of fir five of spruce four of hemlock two of persimmon twelve of ash eighteen of willow nine of poplar and I don't know how many of the beautiful beech. I once counted over thirty different varieties of trees in the space of one acre. And the leaves, their number, their individuality, their variety of shape and tint, the acres of space that those of one great tree would cover if spread out and laid together. In the autumn to watch them fall, how slowly, how rapidly, yet they say nobody ever saw one of them let go homer's comparison to the lives of men how fine better than lucianne's to the bubbles i remember very well one october day in ohio it was long ago in life's morning march when my bosom was young i like to quote from that poem of campbell's it is incomparable of its kind a delightful tramp elderberries the great boerhaave held the elder in such pleasant reverence for the multitude of its virtues that he is said to have taken off his hat whenever he passed it grapes haws pawpaws nature's custard spicewood 
sassafras hickory nuts nearly a primeval forest vines reminding one of brazilian creepers trees that were respectable saplings when columbus landed the dead roots of an ironwood so like a monster as to startle behemoth i thought of he moveth his tail like a cedar thistledown diffused like small vices every seed hath wings here and there a jay or a woodpecker grapevines fantastically running over the tops of tall bushes grouping deformities and any one of which if an artist drew it would be called an exaggeration worse than anything of doré's trees swaying and bowing to one another like stilted clowns in nature's afterpiece of the seasons trees incorporated sycamore and elm maple and hickory modifying and partaking each other's nature resembling so much as to appear one tree a jolly gray squirrel hopping from limb to limb like a robin swinging like an oriole flying along the limb like a weaver's shuttle scared away at length by a scudding cloud of pigeons just brushing the tallest treetops as if kissing an annual farewell clover sorrel penny royal a drink of cider from a bit of broken crockery does he not drink more sweetly that takes his beverage in an earthen vessel than he that looks and searches into his golden chalices for fear of poison and sleeps in armor and trusts nobody and does not trust god for his safety all is fair all is glad from grass to sun not a melancholy day keats's poem on autumn comes to mind and crabs welcome pure thoughts welcome ye silent groves these guests these courts my soul most dearly loves indian summer balzac's comparison to ripe womanhood the significant worn walk round the mean man's field its crooked outline impressively striking all in all a white day memory of it supplies these notes they might be expanded into an essay the country the country though the man who would truly relish and enjoy it must be previously furnished with a large and various stock of ideas which he must be capable of turning over in his own mind of comparing varying and contemplating upon with pleasure he must so thoroughly have seen the world as to cure him of being over fond of it and he must have so much good sense and virtue in his own heart as to prevent him from being disgusted with his own reflections or uneasy in his own company alas end of section ten this recording is in the public domain Section 11 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 2, February 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. The Gopher. The name of gopher, according to Brem, is applied in some American localities to various other widely variant rodents. The zoologists who first described the animal obtained their specimens from Indians who had amused themselves by cramming both cheek pouches full of earth distending them to such a degree that if the animal had walked the pouches would have trailed on the earth these artificially distended pouches obtained for the gopher its name the taxidermists who prepared the dead specimens endeavored to give them what was supposed to be a lifelike appearance by following the practice of the indians in distending the cheek pouches and the artists who delineated the animal followed the models which were accessible to them but too truly in their drawings owing to these circumstances the pictures of gophers of even recent date represent really monstrous animals when they honestly intend to familiarize us with the gopher the gopher may be found east of the rocky mountains and to the west of the mississippi river between the thirty-fourth and fifty-second parallel of north latitude it leads an underground life 
digging tunnels in various directions tunnels of old standing says brehm are packed hard and firm from constant use lateral passages branch off at intervals the main chamber is situated under the roots of a tree at a depth of about four and one half feet the entrance tunnel is sunk down to it with a spiral direction this chamber is large is lined with soft grass and serves for a nesting and sleeping place the nest in which the young numbering from five to seven are born about the beginning of april is lined with the hair of the mother it is surrounded with circular passages from which the tunnels radiate gessner found that a passage leads from the nest to a larger hole the storeroom which is usually filled with roots potatoes nuts and seeds when throwing up the earth the gopher exposes itself to view as little as possible and immediately after accomplishing its purpose plunges back into its hole according to audubon it appears above ground to bask in the sun we have seen it sit at the entrance to its den with an air of bold indifference to the approach of danger and then suddenly vanish underground its acute sense of hearing and great power of scent protected from surprises audubon kept several gophers in captivity for months feeding them on potatoes their appetites were voracious but they would drink neither water nor milk they made incessant efforts to regain their liberty by gnawing through boxes and doors they constantly dragged clothing and other similar objects together utilizing them as bedding first gnawing them to pieces one of them straying into a boot instead of turning back simply gnawed its way through the tip the habit of gnawing was unendurable and audubon incontinently got rid of them the gopher is very destructive to valuable trees and plants for which reason man is its most dangerous enemy the only other foe it has is to fear being water and snakes this pretty little rodent is often found in populous neighborhoods a few years ago the writer saw one rush into a hole under the root of a large osage orange bush in woodlawn chicago curiosity led him to watch for the reappearance of the animal which soon put its head cautiously above the entrance and eyed the intruder with as much interest as a weasel will often show under like circumstances for several weeks the gopher was visible in the morning hours we pointed it out to several persons each of whom declared it to be a ground squirrel there is a great difference in these small animals but they are frequently confounded the name of gopher is applied in some american localities to various other rodents end of section eleven this recording is in the public domain section twelve of birds and all nature volume seven number two february nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by betty b hans and mitzi dr albert schneider hans was a little blue-eyed german orphan who had been adopted by a man and wife because they thought they could make good use of him but to their chagrin they were disappointed hans had been told again and again that he was an ungrateful lazy good-for-nothing this was also the reason why his master whipped him so frequently now hans was only nine years old and of course he could not know that he was so thoroughly bad unless he was told and the telling of it accompanied by cuffs in order to impress this fact more fully upon his dull brain it was really true that hans was lazy and perhaps queer in many ways he disliked hard work preferring to wander about the fields and meadows the ditches pastures and the trees of the nearby forest he had been discovered lying in the grass watching the fleeting clouds overhead and listening to the sighing of the wind in the tall grass and the overshadowing trees in his imagination the breezes whispered soothing words soft and low he watched the busy bees the ants and the black carrion beetles tugging great loads uphill often he had observed a lady with two children about his age going by on their way to sunday school with wistful eyes he would watch the romping of the children and listen to their exclamations of joy as they played among the flowers 
sometimes the kind lady would beckon to hans and talk kindly to him and make him presents then little hans would cry as though his poor heart would break he hid the gifts in a secret nook in the granary which was also his sleeping place and often he would think of the kind lady and her happy children while the love hunger shone in his eyes mitzi was only a half-starved homeless gray kitten which came to hans while he was hoeing in the orchard the two understood each other at once and why should they not both were homeless friendless and soulless everybody knows that a cat much less a stray kitten has no soul you may say that hans was neither a cat nor a kitten but some little boys of the neighborhood had sneeringly remarked that he was a frayed cat besides his master had whipped all the spirit out of him therefore he too was without a soul hans petted mitzi and gave her some bread crusts and hid her in the shed to keep her out of sight of his master mitzi gained in flesh and became very fond of hans and at times would try to follow him but hans would take her back and put her in a more secure place mitzi did not know of the cruel master and in spite of all precautions she finally made her escape and searched for hans she could not find him so she mewed again and again and finally succeeded in attracting not only the attention of hans but also that of the master who promptly picked up a stone and hurled it at mitzi but fortunately missed her it may be that mitzi was not so easily frightened as hans for in time she tried to get to him even if the master was near poor ignorant mitzi she did not know that this show of friendliness would get hans into trouble the master concluded that hans was responsible for the presence of mitzi and ordered him to take her and kill her then and there in agony and despair hans ran to mitzi to frighten her away but she only rubbed her glossy fur against him and purred gently and only when the frenzied master attempted to grasp her out of the protecting arms of hans did she attempt to flee but too late a vicious kick caught her in the side but she managed to escape under the protecting granary in the evening hans went to the shed and called mitzi mitzi and poor suffering mitzi dragged herself far enough so that little hans might stroke her head hans brought some bread and milk but mitzi only mewed piteously in the morning hans found mitzi stiff and cold near the opening of the shed poor hans he sobbed and sobbed and called mitzi mitzi most piteously but missy did not answer her sufferings were over end of section this recording is in the public domain section thirteen of birds and all nature volume seven number two february nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by larry wilson geography lessons it is possible for a pupil to study geography diligently every day and forget apparently nearly everything he learns both geography and history are studies which may be pursued in such a way that nearly all that is acquired in any given month is lost in the next month those who are inclined to doubt this have but to test a class where the text has been the subject of acquisition test them on what they learned a month previously and even those inclined to believe this statement will be astonished that so little is retained of what once seemed to be known so well mr a sweeps his barn with the doors open and the wind blowing against his work he works with much energy and some apparent efficiency but the wind brings back the chaff to such an extent that there is never much clear space on his floor mr b takes advantage of the direction of the wind and every stroke counts for success and is more than doubled in effect by the help of the wind the chaff flies before him and his floor is clear in a short time i have seen a steamer in waters opening upon the bay of fundy pouring out black smoke beating the water into foam and apparently making great progress but observation of the distant shore proved that she was actually standing still the adverse tide was such that she could not contend with it successfully so she dropped her anchor and saved coal and the wear of machinery two hours later she swung with her cable the anchor was hoisted 
and she moved rapidly in the desired direction without the aid of a pound of steam in passamaquoddy bay are so many islands and channels and such a great fluctuation of tide that the rivers are racing in various directions at all times fishermen study their courses and never tack against the tide those who go out every day do not leave home at the same hour tuesday as on monday but just fifty minutes later they do not go and return over the same courses for many times the strongest flow of tide does not run where there was the swiftest ebb with them the proverb the longest way round is the shortest way home is often true and i have heard them quote those words frequently in psychology there are both a wind and a tide the wind is what the pupil thinks of the subject as to its usefulness in his future life the tide is his natural interest in the thing for its own sake wind and tide are sometimes both against us and it is a poor skipper who lacks the sense to tie up for a short time or take another course when he finds both set against him but there are teachers who battle fiercely against the desires and interests of their pupils bound to compel them to learn making a tremulous fuss filling families with tears and tremblings threatening scoldings and reviewings all with no permanent results of value there is a natural interest in children for birds it is so strong and absorbing that it amounts to a psychological tide the things of the bird world act upon the child mind rather instinctively than mentally the whole child is active and alert when the subject is such that it fully interests him a little effective teaching just at that time is worth more than hours of perfunctory drudgery over a similar task presented in the wrong way there are birds wherever man lives they differ in color form and habit according to environment the pupil who seems to be interested least in the ordinary things of the textbook in geography is the very one as a rule to be caught with the birds and animals of various parts of the earth the pupil who will not retain information about the products of a country may be induced to consider intelligently something about the fauna of that country and pass readily to an interested study of the flora and from what grows there to what is shipped from that place end of section thirteen this recording is in the public domain Section 14 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 2, February 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. The Mink, Putorius vison. This soft fur bearing animal has been described by Audubon and Prince de Vied. Its nearest relatives are very closely allied to the polecat and differ from it only by a flatter head, larger canine teeth, shorter legs, the presence of webs between the toes, a longer tail, and a lustrous fur consisting of a close, smooth, short hair resembling otter fur. Its color is a uniform brown. The fur of the American mink is much more esteemed than that of the European, as it is softer and of a more woolly character. According to Audubon, the mink ranks next to the ermine in destructive capacity prowling around the farmyard or duck pond and its presence is soon detected by the sudden disappearance of young chickens and ducklings audubon had a personal experience with a mink which made its home in the stone dam of a small pond near the home of the naturalist the pond had been dammed for the benefit of the ducks in the yard and in this way afforded the mink hunting grounds of ample promise its hiding place had been selected with cunning very near the house and still nearer the place where the chickens had to pass on their way to drink in front of its hole were two large stones which served the mink as a watch-tower from which it could overlook the yard as well as the pond it would lie in wait for hours every day and would carry away chickens and ducks in broad daylight. Audubon found the mink to be especially plentiful on the banks of the Ohio River, and there observed it to be of some use in catching mice and rats. 
but it was also addicted to poaching and fishing. The naturalist observed it to swim and dive with the greatest agility and pursue and attack the quickest of fishes such as the salmon and trout. It will eat frogs or lizards, but when food is plentiful it is very fastidious, preying upon rats, finches and ducks, hares, oysters and other shellfish. In short, Brehm says it adapts itself to the locality and knows how to profit by whatever food supplies it may be able to find. When frightened, it gives forth a very fetid odor, like the polecat. The female gives birth to five or six young at about the end of April. If taken young, they get to be very tame and become real pets. Richardson saw one in the possession of a Canadian lady who used to carry it about with her in her pocket. It is easily caught in a trap of any kind, but its tenacity of life renders it difficult to shoot. The European mink much resembles the American except that it is somewhat smaller and its fur is coarser. Upon a large farm in Michigan visited by the writer this summer ran a creek where the chickens, when the trough was dry, and dry it usually was, traveled to get a drink. In the bank of the creek a mink made his home, and not a week passed that one or more hens did not appear in the barnyard crippled or mangled in a manner painful to behold. Painful, that is, to the visitor, but not apparently to the farmer, who only said, It's that darned mink. Some day when I have time I'll set a trap and catch him and so went coolly on his way, leaving the poor maimed creatures to drag out a painful existence for days or weeks, hoping that nature would heal the wounds made by the mink. Aside from the lack of thrift thus shown by the farmer, for the hens when badly mangled in time succumbed, the inhumane aspect of the case never seemed to strike him. The cultivation of his fields left no time for cultivating the finer feelings of the heart. End of section 14. This recording is in the public domain. Section 15 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 2, February 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson The New Sport by John Winthrop Scott In the early days every man and boy knew how to use a gun. It was a necessity of life. It brought in meat for the family. The regular business of every holiday was to go to the woods and kill. The free life of the woods, the pleasure of ranging about for a purpose, and the excitement attending success in bringing game were among their greater pleasures. Now we live in cities mainly. Even the country boy has less regard for the gun. The game and many of the birds and animals that are not game have been killed off, so that country boys now wish to give them a chance for their lives. Probably the worst murderers of the songsters and innocent animals are the ignorant city youths who get only a day or two in the woods in a year. Guns have been improved to such an extent that whether the gunner has any skill or not, everything in sight can be killed because of the rapidity of fire and the number of chances for killing. A gun has been invented which pours a steady stream of rapid fire as long as you hold the trigger. It was invented for killing men on the battlefield. But there are other guns nearly as destructive that are used for sport. Public schools, Audubon societies, women's clubs, and other humanizing agencies have so modified the ideas of boys and young men that there are but few who hunt for sport. The cheapening of the camera and its perfection for amateur use have placed a new shooting apparatus in their hands, and many young people of both sexes are now more or less expert in making exposures and developing. A shot with a camera is worth more than a shot with a gun. You have to eat or stuff the unfortunate bird or animal you shoot with a gun. When it is gone, you have nothing to show for your skill. The shot with a camera gives you a handsome picture with many thrilling details to relate. 
if you wish to boast you have the evidence at hand to corroborate your statement the pictures last indefinitely are easily stored and may be duplicated at will camera presents last christmas far outnumbered the guns given boys and girls much prefer the new sport to the old with the aid of the bicycle in getting about the country young people are making trips to the country with loaded cameras and bringing in much more satisfactory game than they used to get with guns the skill some of them have manifested in getting a focus on some shy resident of the woods or fields is indeed remarkable imitations of brush heaps are made out of light stuff that may be easily carried about these may be placed before the residence of a rabbit or woodchuck for several days before the attempt is made to get a shot from beneath a great deal of caution is sometimes necessary to get the subject accustomed even to a strange brush heap so he will act naturally at the instant the snap is made two young englishmen made a mock tree trunk of cloth painted its exterior cut holes in it for observation and for the camera tricked it out with vine spread it out on a light frame so they could set it up where they chose and got so many beautiful and scientifically interesting views that they have written a book that has had a large sale it is embellished with half-tone engravings made from their collections of photographs and it is a most delightful and useful addition to one's library it is entitled wild life at home and is published by castle and company of new york it has met with such popularity largely because it has appeared just at the time when so many young people are turning their attention from the killing of birds and animals to the more pleasing and humane business of catching their likenesses in their native haunts dr r w Schufelt of washington a distinguished naturalist has made many photographs of wildlife in the united states and embellished his own works with reproductions of these pictures which are so very interesting and difficult to secure the telephoto lens is a great help in taking the more timid subjects audubon used a telescope to get the most familiar glimpses of these little inhabitants of the forests long before the dry plate was invented what would he not have given to have been the possessor of a means of taking instantly all details and attitudes of the wild birds he loved so well the camera is now adding daily to the accurate knowledge we possess of the things of nature and every young person should own one and become familiar with its rare qualities and usefulness it is very gratifying to think that sport in the woods now means something superior to the old bloody work our boys formerly pursued with guns with a copy of the book above mentioned a boy is equipped with suggestions and directions enough to keep him busy and well employed for several seasons in the section fifteen section sixteen of birds and all nature volume seven number two february nineteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b mole cricket lodge bertha c v sonnier mr and mrs mole cricket had folded their hands for the winter the busy season was over for the ground was all hard with the foot tread of jack frost and the snow lay all over the lodge a solid warm cover that squeaked and crunched quite musically when little boy will rode back and forth on it with his sled dasher shadows lay rather heavily in the lodge the caverns and galleries which had been built in warmer times were hung with darkness and all was still in slumber side by side in the chamber just under the long dead grass and the white snow with a roof formed of tiny roots and loose earth lay mr and mrs mole cricket it was the same chamber in which had lain the little white eggs that the warm sun had hatched and from it the young crickets had gone out already valiant to burrow their own galleries and seek their own food slumber had gone on in the chamber for many weeks when at a sudden sound mr cricket moved we fancy he was cross at being disturbed what's that he said boy will answered his wife 
he's digging up the snow to make a snowman and shouting he'll make us cold grumbled mr cricket then we must go to the cavern but we can't i'm as stiff as a stick i believe i am too the earth that covered their roof was very sandy and loose when not frozen and as it was it yielded readily to persistent thumps such as now fell about it the snow was soggy just right for building purposes and boy will in his enthusiasm scraped up a shovelful of dirt with the last bit of snow that covered the lodge his sharp eyes saw something black lying beneath the little dead roots that had in the summer belonged to his forget-me-nots he took the shovel it was his mother's stove shovel and carefully pried the dark bundle up and with his little red fingers separated it from its wrappings aha he said and ran into the house look a here he cried as he ran up to his father's desk well well said his father looking at the objects through gold bowed spectacles that's the same sort of fellow that we teased last summer with the grass blade tell me said boy will in wonder don't you remember the little hole in the garden and when i put in a spear of grass how the fellow grabbed it with his jaws i drew him out and there was sir mole cricket that does so much mischief in the garden oh yes and now here are two but they are dead no only asleep for the winter the warm room will revive them but they may die after all they will have awakened out of season i wish i could put them back said boy will we will study them a little and then we will see returned his father as he took up his penknife and pointed to the folded legs those big flat forelegs are what do all the mischief they are like strong little hands and have claws on them and they are used for digging the main business of sir cricket is to burrow and he works away with these hands of his until he will have made a number of underground passages and in his work he will cut off hundreds of new tender roots that belong to plants and shrubs and that's the mischief of him what do they eat why little bugs but they are fierce hungry creatures and when they meet a mole cricket that is weak and defenceless they pounce on him and eat him they are no respecter of relatives they don't deserve to live cried boy will with a stamp but we can give them their chances returned mr ray now look at this one there are two sets of wings one outside and one inside like grasshoppers but much shorter here are two delicate feelers or antennae bent backward and two at the end of the body i suppose those are for the purpose of discovering any danger that might approach them from behind while they are busy at digging the jaws are toothed and horny and so all in all we may put sir cricket down in the same order in which are the katydid grasshopper field and house cricket cockroach earwig and so on which is the order orthoptera now come and show me where you found them boy will led the way where stood his half-built snowman and mr ray with a stick felt about in the chamber for the opening to another cavity to the lodge ah here it is a warmer and a better one than the other because it is deeper and he slipped the two objects in and stopped the doorway with earth and snow well i declare said mr mole cricket from under his horny skin what do you think of that why said his wife they've put us in the cavern where we should have been in the first place what a mistake it was to go to sleep in the nursery now we shall be quite safe until spring well well true enough returned sir mole cricket and they both fell asleep again end of section sixteen section seventeen of birds and all nature volume seven number two february nineteen hundred recorded for librivox dot org by betty b snowbirds this poem by louis honore freshette the laureate of canada is very fine in the original and holds the same position in french canadian literature that bryant's lines to a waterfowl occupies in american classics it is one of the poems that won for its author the crown of the french academy and the grand prix 
Montheon of two thousand livres. When the rude equinox with his cold train from our horizons drives a custom cheer, behold, a thousand winged sprites appear and flutter briskly round the frosty plain. No seeds are anywhere save sleety rain, no leafage thick against the outlook drear, rough winds to wildly whip them far and near god's heart alone to feel their every pain dear little travellers through this icy realm fear not the tempest shall you overwhelm the glad spring buds within your happy song go whirl about the avalanche and be o birds of snow unharmed and so teach me whom god doth guard is stronger than the strong c g b end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Section 18 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 2, February 1900. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Vegetation in the Philippines Much attention has of late been devoted to the Philippines and as one result considerable interest has been evinced in their natural products in the matter of vegetation they are highly favored fruits grow in great abundance and the reputation of some of them is already established abroad as is the case for example with the mango other fruits grown in the islands are the eight the cinnamon apple of the french colonists the mangosteen the pineapple the tamarind the orange the lemon the jack and the jujube the lychee regarded by the chinese as the king of fruits the plum the chicken menu the sopadilla of the west indies the breadfruit and the pawpaw the last named is eaten like a melon and is valued as a digestive its juice furnishes an extract which is used as a medicament under the name of papain or vegetable pepsin the banana grows abundantly and is a great boon to the poor people supplying them with a cheap delicious and exceedingly nutritive food there are many varieties ten of which are in particular highly esteemed plants which are cultivated for industrial purposes include the sugar cane of which four varieties are grown yellow cane otahite cane purple or batavia cane and striped cane of vegetables there are several pulses used as food by the natives which never appear on the tables of the european settlers these include the mango mentioned above and three or four kinds of beans such as the butingue the zabache the abra bean and the patami bean these suit the natives much better than the garbanzos or chickpeas that are so highly prized by the spaniards among the tuberous roots valued as food the sweet potato ranks first with an annual production of ninety eight million pounds the common or white potato although of inferior quality stands next in importance then follows the camotin gachoy or manahot cassava the root of which is made edible by the removal of its poisonous juice in the same way as in the west indies after expression of the juice the pulp forms a sort of coarse grained flour that is very nutritious pleasant to the taste and easy to digest besides these tubers other plants such as ubi the togui and the gabi are cultivated in the fields for the sake of their edible roots other edible vegetables include calabashes melons watermelons cucumbers carrots celery parsley tomatoes eggplants peppers capers cabbages lettuce endives mustard leeks onions asparagus and peas of the cocoa palm the ordinary coconut tree is the most important the oil of which is put to many and varied uses the bamboo is much valued the young and tender shoots making a very acceptable article of food in the form of salads or other dishes and the fiber is used for numerous purposes tobacco as a cultivated crop is generally grown in the same field as maize of spices the philippines grow cinnamon nutmegs pepper ginger and majoram of medicinal plants the most familiar are the papa already mentioned and epicauana 
among aromatic and ornamental plants may be mentioned magnolias camellias clematis several kinds of roses dahlias elang elang papua jasmine and many species of orchids and ferns these however grow wild in such profusion that little care is bestowed upon their cultivation gardener's magazine end of section eighteen this recording is in the public domain section nineteen of birds and all nature volume seven number two february nineteen hundred this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org common minerals and valuable ores three minerals containing carbon theodore f brookins b s principal osable forks union free school and academy new york among minerals of economic importance carbon minerals hold the unique position of being at the same time of the most common and the most rare occurrence as far as external appearance indicates a piece of common coal and the most brilliant diamond are widely separated with regard to chemical composition they are closely related intermediate between the coal of the stoke furnace and the brilliant of the jewelry shop is still another well-known form of carbon the graphite of the lead pencil these three substances comprise the far greater part of carbon-containing minerals in so far as our mind's picture of a mineral is that of an aggregation of crystals of fairly perfect form our consideration of coal as a mineral is erroneous we must yield to a broader interpretation of the essential characteristics of a mineral and modify our idea so as to include any homogeneous substance solid with the exception of mercury of fairly definite chemical composition quote, occurring in nature but not of apparent organic origin unquote. organic substances are those that are alive or have lived vegetation is undoubtedly the origin of all coal but often much more than a cursory examination is necessary to prove such origin in the less altered coals the vegetable origin is readily proved by the actual presence of seeds plant fibers and other equally apparent organic remains a microscopic study is necessary for finding the presence of woody fiber in the more metamorphosed form the word metamorphose comes from the greek meta means after or over morphe is form a metamorphosis is a change of form or a forming over the history of the discovery of the value of coal as a means of producing heat and of the development of the coal mining industry covers a comparatively recent period coal occurs in such quantities near the surface of the earth's crust and its outcrops are so numerous that it cannot have failed to attract the attention of the most ancient of peoples indeed that coal could be used as a fuel is mentioned by a writer theophrastus who lived three hundred years b c the ancient celts of britain are reputed to have evidenced knowledge of the industrial value of coal it was not until near the middle of the thirteenth century however that coal became so important an economic product as to result in statutes granting to certain places the privilege of mining it after a long period of trial in england the superiority of coal over other fuels was recognized and stone coal as the harder form was commonly known came into general use in america bituminous or soft coal was mined to a slight extent in the latter half of the eighteenth century the form now commonly used in house heating furnaces anthracite for a long time baffled the colonists in their efforts to make it burn the knowledge that an anthracite fire is most effective if not continually poked is said to have been acquired generally by accident europe and the united states today produce practically all the coal of the world in europe great britain germany france austria hungary and belgium are the main sources of supply several important coal areas exist in our own country notably that of the new england basin with an area of five hundred square miles the appalachian district with an area of sixty five thousand square miles the northern area in michigan covering seven thousand square miles the central area comprising parts of illinois indiana and kentucky and including forty eight thousand square miles the scattered western area with a total of ninety eight thousand square miles the indefinite rocky mountain area and the pacific coast region including parts of california oregon and washington 
Coal mining is yet an undeveloped industry in our territorial possessions. Alaska has an abundant supply of coal, and lesser quantities are found in Cuba and Puerto Rico. Mention has already been made of the two common kinds of coal, bituminous and anthracite. These two kinds mark different stages in the transformation from plant organism to mineral product. As the biologist traces the successive steps in the evolution of an individual of a species from germ to adult, so the geologist unfolds before us the wonderful history of a piece of coal from its first appearance on the earth to the time when it is thrown into our fire grate as fuel. Coal is the metamorphosed product of vegetable growths, changed by atmospheric agencies and the internal forces of the earth, acting through a total period of perhaps millions of years. In the remote past, ages before man had appeared on the earth, the atmosphere of our globe was highly charged with carbon gases. Vegetation flourished in luxuriance. Great swamps were common. The ocean alternately covered and receded from verdure-clothed land areas. Ponds were transformed to morasses and swamps. In the swamps thus formed, the accumulated sediment of centuries upon centuries covered alternate layers of decayed plant organisms, until finally beds of peat were formed. Great masses above pressed on those underneath. The internal heat of the earth reached up and transformed the densely packed masses of peat until the beds became hard and brown, the product of the partial metamorphism being what we know as lignite or brown coal. With the continued action of the forces of metamorphism, the lignite turned still darker and as more gases were driven off became heavier until the bituminous stage was reached which in turn was succeeded by the anthracite stage. Graphite, or black lead, is a mineral containing not more than 5% of impurities, and is generally supposed to have originated as did mineral coal, and to represent a still more advanced stage of development. It occurs in various localities, both in the vicinity of coal measures and far removed from them. The chief part of the world's supply comes from Ceylon, though Germany and the United States produce quantities of graphite of excellent quality. In the Laurentian rocks of Canada, and of course, with as ancient origin, extensive deposits are found. This presence of graphite in strata in which as yet no certain traces of organic life have been found has led some to believe that this form of carbon mineral may have another than organic origin. Various uses are served by graphite. The chemist finds it of great value in making his crucibles, the engineer uses it, finely powdered, as a lubricant. The housekeeper polishes stoves with it. The electrician uses it in his arc lights. All civilized nations use it in the lead of lead pencils. The stem, grapho, to write, on which so many of our words as geography, telegraph, graphophone, etc., are formed, suggests also the origin of the name graphite. The finest quality lead pencils are those made from graphite occurring in a state sufficiently pure to allow the cutting and grinding of pieces to the size needed. In the case of the medium and poorer grade pencils, the graphite has first been finely powdered and then pressed into the requisite shape and size. The purest form of carbon found in nature is the diamond. The rare occurrence of diamonds indicates that the essential conditions in nature for causing the transformation of some less pure form of carbon into diamond are seldom present. While diamonds have actually been produced in the laboratory by far-seeing and indefatigable chemists, yet the cost of such products is so great as to preclude the possibility of the most precious of gems becoming at all common. The diamond is the hardest of all known substances and will scratch any other mineral across which it may be drawn. Three localities have successively furnished the main part of the world's stock of diamonds. A century and a half ago, practically all the diamonds came from India, where at one time 60,000 persons were employed in diamond digging. Toward the middle of the 18th century, when the diamondiferous districts of India were becoming exhausted, the discovery of the precious gem in Brazilian deposits was made. At present, the supply of diamonds from Brazil has much diminished, and the diamond fields of South Africa, where is located the famous Kimberley Mine, produce the larger part of the world's output of diamonds. Among famous diamonds of the world should be mentioned the Koh-i-Noor of the British crown, which Hindu legend relates, was worn 5,000 years ago by one of their national heroes. The largest known diamond, weighing 367 carats, was found in Borneo, 
and is now owned by the Rajah of Matan. End of section 19. Section 20 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 2, February 1900. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. February. February, fortnights too, briefest of the months are you, of the winter's children last. Why do you go by so fast? Is it not a little strange, once in four years you should change, that the sun should shine and give you another day to live? Maybe this is only done since you are the smallest one, so I make the shortest rhyme for you as befits your time. You're the baby of the year, and to me you're very dear, just because you bring the line, will you be my valentine? Frank Dempster Sherman The snow had begun in the gloaming, and busily all the night had been heaping field and highway with a silence deep and white. Every pine and fir and hemlock wore a mind too dear for an earl, and the poorest twig on the elm tree was ridged inch deep with pearl. From sheds new roofed with Carrara came Chanticleer's muffled crow. The stiff rails were softened to swan's down, and still fluttered down the snow. Lowell. End of section twenty. This recording is in the public domain. Section 21 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 2, February 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. Licorice. Glyceriza glabra. Dr. Albert Schneider, Northwestern University School of Pharmacy. But first he cheweth grain and licorice to smell and sweet. Miller's Tale, line 504, Chaucer. The licorice yielding plant is a perennial herb with a thick rootstock having a number of long sparingly branched roots and very long runners of rhizomes. It belongs to the same family as the peas and beans, leguminosae. It has purplish flowers, with the irregular corolla characteristic of the family. The pods are rather small, much compressed, each with from two to five seeds. The plant is in all probability a native of the warm parts of the Mediterranean region. There are several varieties of Glyceriza glabra, all of which are more or less extensively cultivated and placed upon the market. As to the exact habitat of licorice, there is some difference of opinion. According to some authorities, its native home is in the vicinity of the Sea of Azov. Dioscorides was among the first to give a description of the plant and designated the Pontic lands and Cappadonia of Asia Minor as its home. The Romans named the plant Glyceriza. Celsius, Scribonius Largus, and Plinius described it as radix dulcis, sweet root, on account of its sweet taste. Galenus, the eminent Roman physician, made extensive medicinal use of the roots as well as of the juice. Alexander Tralianus also recommended licorice very highly. Although this plant enjoyed extensive use during the Middle Ages, it was apparently not included in the herbal list of Charlemagne, Carl der Grosse. In the 13th century, licorice was highly prized in Switzerland as a remedy for lung troubles. It was similarly used in Wales and in Denmark. Pietro di Crescenzi of Bologna, 1305, was the first to give a full report of the occurrence and cultivation of licorice. 
the benedictine monks of saint michaelis cultivated it extensively in the vicinity of bamberg the eminent authority flukiger reports a peculiar practice by these monks a new hand in the horticultural work was initiated by requiring him to dig up a complete root of a licorice plant with all its branches including the rhizome this was by no means an easy task on account of the ramification of the roots and the extreme length of the rhizome glyceriza is extensively cultivated in greece italy france russia germany the danubian provinces southern china northern africa and to some extent in england in the italian province of calabria licorice is planted with peas and corn in the course of three years the roots are collected the juice expressed and root evaporated to the proper consistency for shipping new crops are grown from cuttings of the rhizomes there is an excellent quality of licorice grown in the vicinity of smyrna the principal commercial varieties are grown in spain southern russia turkey and italy spanish and russian licorice root is dried and shipped in bales or bundles spanish licorice root is unpeeled and occurs in pieces several feet in length russian licorice is usually peeled most of the licorice used in the united states is obtained from italy russia and germany some of the licorice found upon the market is quite fragmentary and very dirty the licorice raised in england is intended for home consumption and is placed upon the market in both the fresh and dried state the fresh roots have an earthy and somewhat nauseous odor the peel or bark of the roots contains tannic acid and a resinous oil both of which are undesirable hence the peeled article is usually preferred the characteristically sweet taste of the licorice roots and rhizomes is due to glycyrrhizin and some sugar glycyrrhizin is a glucoside which splits up into glucose a substance closely akin to sugar and glycyretin a bitter substance the extract of licorice is prepared by crushing the fresh roots or rhizomes then boiling repeatedly in water expressing and then condensing the sap in copper kettles until it is quite hard when cooled in calabria the condensed juice while still warm and pliable is rolled into sticks and stamped with the name of the locality where it was prepared in those countries where the fresh roots cannot be obtained the dried roots are crushed and then treated as above the licorice sticks prepared in this country usually have stamped upon them the initials of the manufacturing firm much of the evaporated juice is also placed upon the market in large lumps or masses the pure licorice extract prepared as indicated above is a glossy black very brittle with a glossy fracture for shipment it must be carefully packed to prevent its being broken into small bits to reduce the brittleness various substances are added as starch and gum arabic licorice extract is a highly appreciated sweetmeat but unfortunately it is often grossly adulterated with dextrin starch sugar and gum arabic many of the licorice drops etc contain very little licorice but even the poorest article seems to be highly prized by the average child licorice extract in mass is known as licorice paste and is extensively employed in preparing chewing tobacco and in brewing beer to which substances it imparts a peculiar flavor and a dark color licorice extract is a popular remedy for colds and sore throat though its curative powers are certainly very slight physicians make extensive use of it to disguise the disagreeable taste of medicines such as quinine it is an ingredient of many cough remedies the finely powdered roots are dusted over pills to prevent their adhesion and to give them consistency licorice roots have the same properties as they extract and may be similarly used many children prefer the dried roots obtained at the drug store to the stick licorice 
or the licorice drops this choice is in many respects a good one the roots are at least not adulterated but of course only the juice should be swallowed a precaution which is not necessary to emphasize as the fibrous nature of the wood makes it difficult to swallow even if a little of it is swallowed no particular harm would be done as it is not in the least poisonous though the fibers may act as an irritant to the stomach as already indicated there are several species of glycerisa of which the roots and rhizomes are used like those of glycerisa glabra but in addition to these there are a number of other plants designated as licorice indian licorice or the wild licorice of india abrus precatorius is a woody twining plant growing quite abundantly in india it is sometimes substituted for true licorice prickly licorice glycerisa echinata resembles true licorice quite closely the wild licorice of america glycerisa levidota is found in the northwest its roots are quite sweet and often used as a substitute for true licorice the european plant known as rest harrow ononis spinosa so called because its tangled roots impede the progress of the harrow has roots with an odor and taste resembling licorice the roots are extensively employed by the country practitioners of france and germany in the treatment of jaundice dropsy gout rheumatism toothache ulcers and eruptive diseases of the scalp the name wild licorice also applies to gallium circasens and gallium lanceolatum on account of the sweetish roots the wild licorice of australia is teocrium corimbosum licorice vetch astragalus glycifilus has sweet roots licorice weed scoparia dulcis is a common tropical plant which also has sweet tasting roots end of section twenty one Section 22 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 2, February 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. A Winter Walk in the Woods, Anne W. Jackson last week i had the good fortune to be invited with two other girls to spend a few days in the country we hailed the invitation with delight and accepted it with alacrity for we all three loved to get out in the woods and fields we started on friday afternoon going the first part of the journey by train the sky was cloudy and the weather mild we watched the moving pictures that sped by the car windows as eagerly as children after a half hour's ride we arrived at a little town consisting of the station one store one house one grain elevator and a blacksmith's shop here our hostess met us with a surrey and pear and we were soon driving along at a brisk pace drinking in the fresh air and country scenery with pure delight the person whose power of enjoyment in little things has become blunted is greatly to be pitied ours was as keen as though newly sharpened for the occasion and nothing we saw from the fields trees and hedges to the setting sun failed to give us pleasure a merry drive of three or four miles brought us to the farmhouse where we were cordially welcomed i should like to tell you about all the fun we had that night for it was our hostess's birthday and there was a surprise party at which we were as much surprised as she was but as it is our walk i am going to tell about i must leave the events of our first evening unrelated the next morning we three girls decided to take a walk as we were anxious to see what birds there were about it was a gray day threatening rain and very wild for december the moment we set foot out of doors the distant caw caw of the crows sounded like an invitation in our ears how i love that sound it is to the ear what a dash of color is to the eye we took the road to the right 
where we saw some woods a quarter of a mile or more away before we had gone far we heard a medley of bird notes coming from the fields on our left we couldn't make out what they were as they were some distance away but i caught a note now and then that sounded like a fragment of the meadowlark's song just a faint reminiscence of it after passing two pastures and a cornfield on our left we came to a piece of thin timberland the road which began to descend here had been cut down somewhat leaving banks more or less steep on either side we went along slowly stopping frequently to examine the beautiful mosses and lichens which abounded we had seen no birds with the exception of a woodpecker at close range yet presently we came to a turn in the road which led us up a slight rise of ground bordered on both sides by woods arrived at the top of this hillock we loitered about looking at the many interesting things that are always to be seen in the woods all at once we were startled by a shrill scream or cry which sounded like some young animal being strangled and behold an immense hawk flew off over the tree-tops it didn't fly very far though and gave us more of its music at intervals the road from this point led down to a small brook spanned by a wooden bridge looking down toward this bridge a gorgeous sight met our eyes a flock of cardinals half a dozen or more were flying and sporting about among the low bushes near one end of it what a delicious touch of color for a winter landscape there were chickadees too hopping about among them in a most neighborly fashion we watched them closely quietly drawing nearer and nearer pretty soon they flew into the trees close by and from thence deeper into the woods we saw and heard many woodpeckers both the downy and the hairy being very plentiful as the place where we had seen the redbirds was such a pretty one we were in no haste to leave it even after they had departed so we perched ourselves on top of an old rail fence and waited for some birds to come to us and be looked at we hadn't been there very long before some tufted titmice came into the trees near us and delighted us with their cheery notes and cunning ways the caw of the crows was quite loud here and with the added notes of the woodpeckers and chickadees made it quite lively every once in a while a few drops of rain would fall but this only added to the wildness of our surroundings and seemed to put us further away from the rest of the world though we found our rural perch very enjoyable we felt obliged to move on again however reluctantly so we crossed the bridge and climbed the hill beyond a short walk then brought us to another turn to the right but on the left an open gate into the woods we lost no time in turning in here you may be sure we found many more birds inside the woods than we had along the road here were titmice chickadees plenty of nuthatches white-breasted hairy and downy woodpeckers and also a third kind that we were uncertain about its upper parts looked like black and white shepherd's plaid and the back of its head and nape were deep red its note was a sonorous cow 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 we heard brown creepers about and saw many flocks of juncos when we came to the end of the woods we saw a pair of our cardinals flying about some low brushwood it was like seeing old friends i must not forget to mention the blue jay who added his voice and brilliant color to the pleasure of our walk we had entered a cornfield and as we advanced flocks of little birds mostly juncos would start up before us and fly into the hedge or next field twittering gaily twice we heard distinctly the goldfinch's note but as the birds all flew up at our approach we couldn't get near enough to distinguish them it seemed very odd to hear this summery note amidst that wintry scene we crossed the cornfield and came to a fence at right angles following which took us in the direction of the road just as we came up to a few scattered trees part in the field and part in the pastures on the other side of the fence we again heard our medley chorus of many voices some of which had reminded us of the meadowlarks the members of the chorus who proved to be the meadowlarks cousins the rusty blackbirds settled in these trees and gave us a selection in their best style some of the solo parts were really sweet after climbing a rail fence 
we crossed a small pasture and looked in vain for a gate nothing but barbed wire we finally made our escape through a pig's corn pen from whence we emerged into another pasture where the grass was like the softest carpet to our feet this pasture had a gate opening on to the road so we were very soon back again at the house with appetites for dinner fully developed we saw and heard no less than fourteen different kinds of birds during our walk so those who desire to see birds need not despair of finding them because it is winter nature always has plenty of beautiful things to show us no matter what the time of year my story ought to end here but i must tell you about the tufted tits we saw next morning the weather turned very cold that night and in the morning a keen wind was blowing so we didn't think many birds would be about but hearing some chickadees in the yard we ventured out and went across the road where we sat down in the shelter of a large corn crib from here we saw plenty of chickadees titmice nuthatches and other woodpeckers busily engaged in hunting their breakfasts we had a fine opportunity of studying them with our glasses one bold tit stole a grain of corn from the crib and carried it off to the tree in front of us where he took it in his claw and proceeded to pick the choicest morsel out of it presently another tufted rogue flew up and there were some passages of arms and a flight into another tree and in the midst of the fray alas the corn was dropped End of section 22section 23 of birds and old nature volume 7 number 2 february 1900 recorded for librivox.org by tavarish the scarlet painted cup professor william kerr highly secretary of the chicago academy of sciences these children of the meadows born of sunshine and of showers whittier the scarlet painted cup belongs to a large and interesting group of plants known as the figwort family scrofulariaceae the common name of the family is derived from the reputed value of some of the species in the cure of ficus or figwort a disease caused by the growth of a stalked excrescence on the eyelids tongue or other parts of the body that are covered with a mucous membrane the technical name is derived from scrofula as some of the species are considered efficacious in the treatment of that disease this family includes about one hundred and sixty five genera and over twenty five hundred species they are common all over the world reaching from the equator into the regions of constant frosts it is claimed by some authorities that fully one thirty-fifth of all the flowering plants of north america are classed in this family besides the painted cup there are classed in this group the mullen the common toad flax the foxglove digitalis the gerardias and the calceolarias the foxglove though causing death when the extract is taken in excess is one of the most highly valued medicinal plants known nearly all the species of the family are herbs without fragrance some of the species are known to be partially parasitic true parasites are usually white of very light colored and contain no green coloring matter which is essential when the plant is self-supporting the parasitic forms of this family however do contain green coloring matter and are thus not entirely dependent on their host for the preparation of their food supply the gerardias false fox gloves are frequently found attached to the roots of oaks large shrubs and even on the roots of grasses it has also been shown that there is a cannibalistic tendency in some of the species of gerardia they will not only fasten their sucker-like roots on those of other species but also upon those of other individuals of the same species and even upon the root branches of their own plants this double parasitism is not rare the scarlet painted cup of our illustration 
Castilia coccinea, Linnaeus, is a native of the eastern half of the United States and the southern portion of Canada. It prefers the soil of meadows and moist woods and has been found growing abundantly at an elevation of from three to four thousand feet. The generic name was given this plant by Linnaeus in honor of a Spanish botanist. The specific name is from the Latin, meaning scarlet. Nearly all of the 40 species are natives of North and South America. The flowers are dull yellow in color and are obscured by the rather large floral leaves or bracts, which are bright scarlet, rarely bright yellow, in color. These conspicuous leaves are broader toward the apex and usually about three-cleft. By the novice, they are usually mistaken for the flower, which is hardly noticeable. The stem seldom exceeds a foot in height and bears a number of leaves that are deeply cut in narrow segments. The bright color of this plant has given it many local names more or less descriptive. Prominent among these is the Indian paintbrush. A pretty myth tells us that the painted cup was originally yellow, but that Venus, when lamenting the death of Apollo, pressed a cluster of the blossoms to her parched lips and drank the dew from the flowers, the outer leaves of which have ever since retained the color of her lips. End of section 23. This recording is in the public domain. Section 24 of Birds and All Nature, Volume 7, Number 2, February 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Young Naturalist, Sahara Sea. Much of the great desert of Sahara is below the level of the Atlantic. It is proposed that the water be let in. The space covered would be big enough to warrant us in speaking of it as an ocean. There would be islands in it, as there are places that are of considerable elevation. So much water would make a difference in climate in all directions from the present desert. It is thought the vineyards of southern Europe would be injured, as they are dependent on the dry winds that come across the mediterranean from the great desert the rainfall in at least one-third of the inhabited parts of the globe would be affected by this great change in the amount of water on the surface ships would be able to sail to ports at the south of morocco and algiers where now are shifting sands and few people and new cities would spring into being far to the south where the new coastline would be formed there are other low and barren spots on the earth's surface that are below sea level they would form useful basins of water if the proper canals were dug a company has been formed to let water into the yuma desert in southern california where thirteen thousand square miles of land with no